On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I wish you all welcome to the 2021 Nobel Lectures in Physics and Chemistry and the lecture of the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. We are just about to enjoy enlightenment from exceptional researchers who will broaden our views in three different areas of research. But once again, just like last year, the COVID-19 pandemic means that the format today will deviate from the long Nobel Prize tradition. The Nobel lectures will be delivered from different parts of the world rather than here in Stockholm. It has been a dramatic year with a heartbreaking number of human deaths and immense suffering due to the ravaging COVID-19 coronavirus. But on the other hand, we have seen astounding scientific breakthroughs that have in record time produced vaccines that successfully limit the spread of the virus. When Alfred Nobel wrote his testament in 1895, uh, one year before he passed away, he pointed out that the five prizes he described should be decided with no consideration of nationality and the prizes should be awarded to the worthiest person. The last two years have indeed made clear to all of us that research is an international endeavor. Regarding the efficiency of vaccines, the numbers speak for themselves. Statistics is an essential tool to analyze large data sets and to understand complex matters. Sadly, however, some people still use anecdotal data to question the efficiency of the vaccines. Such misinformation is propagated unintentionally or even intentionally with devastating consequences in terms of human lives and suffering. Another area where statistics and mathematics are invaluable tools is for understanding complex physical systems like the climate. To realize that climate is changing and why. This has been clarified by this year's Nobel laureates in physics. And here too, opponents have used selected observations in their efforts to disregard the big picture and to disinform. Research is quite obviously a prerequisite for increased and understanding and progress. But our societies also need insightful policy decisions to devote sufficient resources to combating pandemics and to achieve sustainable development. This year's laureates in chemistry have discovered and developed novel and ingenious methods to synthesize molecules. Their work allows increased precision and has become useful for a broad range of applications. The economy laureates have introduced and applied new methods in their field. This has allowed correlations to be turned into understanding of causation, leading to important new and surprising insights. All these achievements not only bring new knowledge and deeper understanding, but already allow us to improve our societies in multiple ways and to take wiser decisions. The continuous progress of science and research was summarized succinctly and humbly by Sir Isaac Newton in a letter to Robert Hooke in 1675. He wrote, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Today, we will listen to prize lectures by giants on whose shoulders present and future humans can stand and new giants in research will surely arise. I now invite my colleague in the Academy of Sciences, Professor Tush Hans Hansson, who is the chairperson of the Nobel Committee for Physics to introduce the laureates in physics. Once again, very welcome everybody to this year's Nobel lectures. This year's Nobel Prize in Physics is divided into two parts, with both sharing the overall theme of groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of complex systems. In nature, as well as in society, complexity is not the exception, it's the rule. 
Physics is traditionally associated with simple systems, such as single atoms, ideal gases, light rays, or perfect crystals. Because these systems were the first to yield to a precise mathematical treatment while still providing idealized descriptions of real systems of immense conceptual and technological importance. However, to go further in our striving to understand, predict, and control natural phenomena, we are forced to confront complexity that cannot be understood by making small modifications of simple systems. This year's prize is awarded for fundamental work on two important problems where only a direct assault on the complex can lead to progress. To master the complexities of the coupled systems of Earth, sea, ice, clouds, vegetation and air, which determines the Earth's climate, is arguably the most important practical problem now facing science and humanity. The basic science of the complex, understanding glassy materials, is a deep problem that sends tendrils into diverse branches of human knowledge beyond the realm of physics, such as computer science and neurobiology. The first part of the prize is awarded jointly to Dr. Shruke Manabe of Princeton University and Professor Klaus Hasselmann of the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Hamburg. And the Academy's citation reads, for the physical modeling of Earth's climate, quantifying variability and reliably predicting global warming. The first of today's lectures on the physics of climate will be given by Dr. Manabe, who was born in 1931 and educated at the University of Tokyo. Most of his later career has been in the United States with appointments at the US Weather Bureau and later at Princeton University, where he is now active. Dr. Manabe and collaborators have developed advanced models for the greenhouse effect, as well as the general circulation models that are essential for weather predictions. And now I invite you all to listen to the first of this year's Nobel lecture given by Dr. Manabe. It is a great honor to be chosen by the Royal Swedish Academy of Science to receive the Nobel Prize established through the generosity and foresight of Mr. Nobel. It is likewise a great pleasure to give a talk on global warming, the subject that I have enjoyed exploring throughout my career. On this occasion, I would like to thank the late Joseph Smagorinsky, the inaugural director of Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory of National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, USA. It has been a great privilege and pleasure to work at the laboratory on labeling the secret of climate change. Today, I would like to discuss the role of greenhouse gas in climate change using a relatively simple climate model that we constructed prior to 1990. I begin with the explanation of so-called greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. The energy balance of our planet is maintained between a net incoming solar shortwave radiation and outgoing radiation at the top of the atmosphere. According to satellite observation, the globally average value of outgoing radiation is 240 watt per square meters. Assuming that Earth's atmosphere system 
radiate as a black body according to Stefan Boltzmann's law of black body radiation. One can estimate the effective emission temperature of the planet. Temperature thus obtained is minus 18.7 degrees centigrade, which is colder than 14.7 degrees centigrade, which is the global mean temperature of our surface. This implies that our surface is warmer than it would be in the absence of the atmosphere by as much as 33 degrees centigrade. In other words, atmosphere has a so-called greenhouse effect that increases the temperature of our surface by as much as 33 degree centigrade. It is the satellite observation of outgoing radiation that has provided the most convincing evidence for the existence of the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. In order to illustrate schematically the thermal structure and greenhouse effect of the atmosphere, this slide was constructed. In this figure, the slanted line indicates schematically the vertical temperature profile of the troposphere where temperature decreases almost linearly with height. The vertical line segment above the slanted line illustrates schematically the almost isothermal lower stratosphere. The dot in the middle troposphere indicates effective emission center of the outgoing radiation from the top of the atmosphere. Its temperature is minus 18.7 degrees centigrade, which may be compared with plus 14.7 degrees centigrade, which is a global mean temperature of our surface. The latter is warmer than the former by about 33 degrees centigrade indicating the magnitude of greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. Radiative transfer from the Earth's surface and in the atmosphere obeys Kirchhoff's law. It requires that for a given wavelengths, the absorptivity of a substance is equal to its emissivity, which is defined as a ratio of the actual emission to the theoretical emission from black body. Because our surface behave almost as a black body, it has an absorptivity that is close to one, absorbing almost completely the downward flux of long wave radiation and short wave radiation that reaches the earth's surface. In keeping with Kirchhoff's law, our surface emit an upward flux of long wave radiation almost as a black body. As this upward flux penetrates into the atmosphere, it is depleted due to the absorption by greenhouse gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. But it is also accreted with, because of emission from these gases. In short, upward flux decreases or increases with height depending upon whether depletion is larger than accretion or vice versa. Although these greenhouse gases are minor constituent of the atmosphere, they as a whole absorb major fraction of upward flux of black body radiation emitted by the Earth's surface. On the other hand, atmosphere also emits upward flux of long wave radiation. Since Kirchhoff's law 
requires the absorptivity of the atmosphere to be equal to its emissivity, the absorptivity of upward flux emitted by the relatively warm Earth's surface is uh, substantially larger than emission of upward flux by the relatively cold atmosphere. Thus, atmosphere traps substantial fraction of upward flux of non-wave radiation emitted by the Earth's surface before it reaches the top of the atmosphere, thereby keeping our surface warm and habitable. So far, I have explained why the atmosphere has a so-called greenhouse effect that traps the substantial fraction of the downward flux of long-wave radiation emitted by the Earth's surface. Here, I shall explain why temperature increase, not only at the Earth's surface, but also in the troposphere, as concentration of greenhouse gas increase the atmosphere. If a greenhouse gas, such as carbon dioxide, increase the atmosphere, the infrared opacity of air increases making it harder for the radiation emitted from the lower layer of the atmosphere to reach the top of the atmosphere. Consequently, average height of layer from which the outgoing radiation originates increases as the concentration of greenhouse gas increases in the atmosphere. In short, the more opaque the atmosphere is, the higher is the effective center of upward flux that reaches the top of the atmosphere. Since the effective center A of the outgoing radiation is located in the troposphere, where temperature decreases with increasing height, the temperature of the center decreases as it moves upward, thereby reducing outgoing radiation from the top of the atmosphere. The change in the concentration of greenhouse gas affects not only the outgoing long wave radiation from the top of the atmosphere, but also downward flux that reach the Earth's surface. If the concentration of greenhouse gas increase in the atmosphere, the infrared opacity of air increases, making it harder for the radiation from the higher layer of the atmosphere to reach our surface. Consequently, there is downward shift of effective center of downward flux as the concentration of greenhouse gas increase in the atmosphere. In short, the more opaque the atmosphere is, the lower is the emission center of the downward flux that reach our surface. Because with decreasing height in the troposphere, the temperature at the center also increases as it moves downward, thereby increasing downward flux that reach our surface. The radiative response of surface troposphere system to an increasing greenhouse gas can be regarded as a result of two related processes. The first process involves increasing downward flux of radiation that increase the temperature of our surface. Over a sufficiently long period of time, the Earth's surface return to overlining troposphere practically all the radiative energy it receives, with summer energy being transported upward through moist and dry convection, long-wave radiation, and large-scale circulation in the atmosphere. Thus, temperature increases not only at the Earth's surface, but also 
in the overlining troposphere. The second process involves the upward flux of long wave radiation at the top of the atmosphere in response to an increase in the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gas. If the amount of greenhouse gas were to increase without allowing the temperature of the surface troposphere system to change, the upward flux of long wave radiation at the top of the atmosphere would decrease, as explained earlier, to maintain the radiative heat balance of the planet as a whole. The surface troposphere system warms just enough for the effect of these processes to balance such that top of the atmosphere flux of outgoing radiation remain unchanged despite the warming. The global scale increase of overall temperature of surface troposphere system is often called global warming. An important factor that affects the magnitude of global warming is a positive feedback process that involves water vapor, which absorbs and emits strongly over much of the spectral range of terrestrial long wave radiation and is mainly responsible for the powerful greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. As we know, the absolute humidity of the air usually increases with increasing temperature, thereby increasing greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. The positive feedback effect between temperature and greenhouse effect of the atmosphere is called water vapor feedback. It magnifies the global warming that is induced by long-lived greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. It was the middle of 1960 when we developed one-dimensional vertical column of atmosphere in which heat balance in the atmosphere and Earth's surface are maintained through close interaction between radiative and convective heat transfer. The model turned out to be very useful for evaluating how temperature changes at the Earth's surface and in the atmosphere in response to the change in atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. Using the model, we obtained vertical temperature profile of atmosphere in radiative convective equilibrium, not only for the normal concentration of the atmosphere, that is 300 parts per million by volume, but also for two other concentrations, that is 150 parts per million and 600 parts per million. This figure shows vertical temperature profile of the coupled atmosphere as surface system in radiative convective equilibrium, which are obtained for these three concentrations. As explained already, temperature increase not only at the Earth's surface, but also in the troposphere, as the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide doubles from 150 to 300 parts per million and 300 to 600 parts per million, whereas its decrease in the stratosphere. In the troposphere, as the temperature increase from blue line to black line to red line, you can see, but if you look at higher up in the stratosphere, temperature actually decreases from blue line to black line and red line. The magnitude of the warming in the troposphere is 2.3 degrees centigrade in both cases. 
and is practically identical to each other. To evaluate quantitatively the influence of water vapor feedback upon the simulated warming, we conducted another set of run in which water vapor feedback was disabled. In these run, the distribution of absolute humidity was prescribed to remain unchanged rather than being adjusted to maintain the constant relative humidity. From the difference among the three states of radiative convective equilibrium thus obtained, we estimated magnitude of the equilibrium response of surface temperature in the absence of water vapor feedback. We found the surface temperature increase by approximately 1.3 degrees centigrade in response to the doubling of atmospheric carbon dioxide. that we got in the presence of water vapor feedback. These experiments indicate that water vapor has a powerful feedback effect that magnifies surface temperature change by a substantial factor. The one-dimensional radiative convective model was developed as an important step towards the development of three-dimensional general circulation model of the atmosphere, which in turn evolved into a coupled atmosphere-ocean model. As shown in this box diagram, the coupled model consists of three major components, which are the general circulation model of the atmosphere indicated by green box. That of the ocean indicated by blue boxes. And the simple heat and water balance model of the continental surface indicated by brown boxes. Although initial version of coupled model was constructed in the late 1960s, it took two more decades before the coupled model with realistic geography became ready for the global warming experiment conducted in the 1980s. The result from the experiment was published in the 1980s and was discussed extensively in the first report of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and published in 1990. For further detail of this study, see our book entitled Beyond Global Warming, recently published by Princeton University Press. Global warming involves change not only in temperature, but also in the rate of evaporation and that of precipitation. If a greenhouse gas such as water vapor and carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere, the downward flux of long-wave radiation increases at the Earth's surface as explained already, thereby increasing temperature of our surface. Since the saturation vapor pressure at our surface increases with increasing temperature, it is expected that rate of evaporation from the Earth's surface also increases so long as relative humidity of the overlying atmosphere does not change systematically. Given sufficient time, global scale increase in the rate of evaporation results in the corresponding increase in the rate of precipitation, thereby increasing the strength of global water cycle.
precipitation and evaporation, but also their geographical distribution due mainly to the increase in the rate of horizontal transport of water vapor by large-scale circulation in the atmosphere. When temperature increases in the atmosphere, in response to the increase in the concentration of long-lived greenhouse gas, such as carbon dioxide, it is expected that the absolute humidity of air increases, keeping relative humidity air more or less unchanged through precipitation. Thus, it is expected that horizontal transport of water vapor by large-scale circulation also increases in the atmosphere. This is the main reason why the distribution of precipitation change differently from that of evaporation as global warming proceeds, affecting substantially the distribution of water availability, such as rate of river discharge and amount of soil moisture at the continental surface. For example, precipitation usually increases in many water-rich regions in high northern latitude and heavily precipitating region of the tropics, increasing river discharge and frequency of floods. In contrast, soil moisture usually decreases in many relatively arid regions in the subtropics and other water-poor regions that are relatively dry increasing the frequency of drought. The implied amplification of existing difference between water poor and water rich region present a very serious challenge to water resources manager of the world. Thank you very much for listening. The second lecture on the theme of climate is given by Professor Hasselmann, who was also born in 1931 and spent his early years in the United Kingdom. After returning to Germany after the Second World War, he studied at the universities of Hamburg and Göttingen. His career progressed via appointments at renowned institutions in Europe and the United States, to the directorship of the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Hamburg, where he is now active. Professor Hasselmann's work has provided crucial insights into the relationship between weather and climate, and he has developed the fingerprinting methods that are presently used to assess the human impact on Earth's climate. And with this, I <laughs> invite you to listen to Professor Hasselmann's Nobel Lecture. Honorable members of the Nobel Committee, ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues around the world, I am overwhelmed and still cannot believe the honor I received through the Nobel Prize. Receiving this prize is like giving a boy a box of chocolates simply because he was deeply involved in building a Lego structure. So thank you again for this honor, which I still cannot quite believe. I'm now 90 years old, and the research for which I am receiving the Nobel Prize was carried out over 40 years ago. Therefore, I have to thank Hans von Storch and my wife Susanna for helping to activate, activate my memory again during the writing of this speech. Before I talk about my research on climate change, let me say a few words about my research before 1974, which led to my interest in climate change. I started by developing a basic equation for the energy balance in an ocean wave spectrum. This was a little different from the equations that other colleagues had developed before. It was clear that one important term had been missing in the previous conversation of the nonlinear energy transfer. I developed an equation including the transfer of energy from the peak of the wave spectrum towards lower and higher frequencies. This is described by a six-dimensional Boltzmann integral and was verified in, in, in an experiment, John Swap, the Joint North Sea Wave Project. 
later in 1969 in the North Sea. Figure 1 shows the source terms of the energy balance equations with the, with the input of the wind enhancing the peak with the spectrum, a low dissipation by way of breaking, and the non-energy transfer, SNL. The result is shown in Figure 2 as a set of directionally integrated frequency wave spectra as measured along an array perpendicular to the coastline. The peak is enhanced by the wind input and shifted to lower frequencies by the nonlinear wave interaction. I extended the nonlinear energy transfer technique also to other wave phenomena, such as seismic waves and also to plasma physics. When applied Feynman diagrams to the latter, the idea came to me that I could understand elementary particle interaction through a new theory by adding to the four space-time dimensions eight extra dimensions, representing interacting non-linear, non-gravitational wave components, as well as electromagnetic strong and weak forces. The theory combines the special and general relativity theories of Einstein. However, at the time I was already working on my first stochastic climate model, and my ideas about, particle, about particles remained a hobby. So, in the first and one and a half decades of my scientific life, I studied mostly wave dynamics, wave interactions, and in particular ocean waves, and also air-sea interaction problems. This added substantial knowledge about the ocean to my thinking about physics, and expanded my general interest, eventually leading to my investigations of weather and climate. But then something unexpected happened. In 1974, Raymond Luce, the president of the Max Planck Society, knocked on my door and did nothing else than offer me the opportunity to establish and direct a new Max Planck Institute, an institute to deal with the climate problem, in particular the perspective that the ongoing emissions of greenhouse gases would change the climate. When I was offered the directorship of the Max Planck Institute, I was happy that as a Max Planck director, I would have complete freedom in research. For this, I am very grateful. This was shortly after the Club of Rome had published its first warnings that mankind was restoring the planet. We had all read the book with great interest. My scientific curiosity was stimulated. My friend David Keeling had already started in 1960 to measure CO2 from Mauna Loa Mountain on the island of Hawaii. At first, nobody took him seriously, but later his curve became the standard reference curve for model computations. Let me briefly explain the global balance in the climate system with two graphs. The radiation of the sun is partially reflected by the Earth, most, mostly by clouds. What remains heats the surface. This causes the surface to warm and would continue to do so were it not for the fact that the surface itself emits radiation in the, in the infrared, and increasingly so with warming. Water vapor and some trace gases, notably CO2, are effective in absorbing energy radiated from Earth's surface before it escapes to space. While these greenhouse gases ultimately re-emit the energy they observe, not all of it goes in the right direction. Some is emitted back towards the surface. This is what we call the greenhouse effect, and it forces Earth's surface to work more than it would otherwise be required to balance heating from the sun. The effect is not small. Were it not for the greenhouse effect, Earth would be 30 degrees cooler, which would cause the oceans to freeze, leading to a less absorbed sunlight and colder yet temperatures. So the greenhouse effect makes Earth habitable, but there can be too much of a good thing. Many processes, not just in the atmosphere, but also in the ocean and the biosphere, influence Earth's ability to balance its energy budget. Although I had been confronted by climate issues only in passing, I was convinced, as similarly also by Malus, that I would quickly learn what was needed, which I hope I did. When I began my climate research, everybody thought I would immediately buy a big computer. However, I first wanted to understand the basic theoretical principles of climate change. My first climate paper on the subject was the stochastic climate model, which provided an insight into the formation of long-term internal variations excited by short-term random weather fluctuations. It was shown that the short-term weather fluctuations can trigger long-term climate variations. For me, the first challenge was the question of what causes the variability of the climate system. Even if the data were far from being perfect in terms of accuracy, temporal, extension, and spatial coverage, it was clear that the spectrum of climate variations was mostly red. 
There are some spectral peaks, in particular the annual and diurnal cycle tides, and also the ice age related cycles. But apart from these, the spectrum was that of an Ornstein Uhrenbeck process, which later went by the prosaic technical term of an autoregressive process of first order. The figure visualizes how we thought in the 1970s of the spread of the variance across time scales. Even though various modes had been found to be active in the atmosphere dynamics, such as the Southern Oscillation, the North Atlantic Oscillation, and many more oscillations. None of them were red oscillations, but instead processes associated with certain timescales. Indeed, the term timescale became the key for what followed. I saw an analogy with Brownian motion, where infinitely many small particles collide randomly with a heavy particle, which then begins to exhibit slow variations in response. My colleague Mojit Latif later formulated this in a nice picture. The short-term variability of the atmosphere can be regarded as tennis balls that are kinetically thrown at a heavy medicine ball against the ocean. That at first does not respond, but it begins to roll, or rather causes something to be rolled, finally bringing about long-term climate change. Thus the ocean is, in effect, the long-term long memory of climate. Thus I described weather and climate in terms of two time scales, short-term stochastic with sta stationary fluctuations, represented by a wide spectrum, which was associated with the weather, and time scales of days and weeks and long-term variations of years up to millennia and more, representing climate variations. Some of the latter may be forced by external factors, greenhouse gases being a prominent example. But it turned out that eternal variability is also formed, generated by the short-term weather variability. The short-term variations are integrated by the inert climate system, resulting in a red spectrum as predicted by an autoregressive process. For myself, as a theoretical physicist, this was pretty obvious. But in my academic surroundings, these ideas were a bit outlandish, even if some thinkers had dealt with such concepts before. I presented these ideas in my first paper as director of the new Mass Planck Institute. It was published in 1976 as part one of a series on stochastic climate models in the journal Tennis. This paper is one of those which was apparently recognized by the Nobel Committee as being worthy of this distinguished prize. As apparently not unusual with me, others thought my original paper was not an easy read. And I shall maybe apologize to youngsters who have trouble understanding the concept. But then a colleague asked me some three decades later if I would not like to write a clear update. I declined. I then co-workers had developed the concept into a really simple form. In any case, the concept was soon widely accepted and the door stood open for accepting the study of climate radiations as an issue of a sarcastic but forced system. In the following years, co-workers of mine, among them Peter Lemke and Claude Fankinur, tested the concept I had sketched in part one of the, and on the paper in parts two and three for a number of cases for example, of sea ice and sea surface temperature variations. The direct consequence of this stochasticity is the need to discriminate between climate variations due to external factors and those related to internal variability, for example, when the response of the climate system to elevated greenhouse gases, gas concentrations is considered. Unfortunately, we see nowadays a tendency to attribute all climate-related variations to external factors disregarding the emergence of unprovoked internal stochastic excursions of the system. The internal variability is referred to in this context as noise. Thus, we look for the detection of so-called signals which cannot be explained by internal variability, and in case of success, compare this signal with the expected changes due to different forcings. If the sonality is sufficiently good, we attribute the signal to these external factors. This was a central subject of another paper of mine in 1979, published by the Royal Society in London. The first was to define the noise from the data, educated intuition or extended model simulations, and to construct expected responses or guesses of fingerprints to the possible forcing factors. To do so, the dimension of the noise space must be strongly reduced. Otherwise, the needed covariance matrix of the noise cannot be determined. One way to achieve this is to consider only that part of the phase space spanned by the dominant eigenvectors or empirical orthogonal functions, the EOFs. 
If the guess is sufficiently realistic, one may thereby determine a priori the subspace that is associated with the maximum signal-to-noise ratio. The patterns representing the subspace define then the optimal fingerprint. As before, after working out the concept, I began with co-workers to test and explore the merits of the answers. But we did not address the global warming challenge directly. Some 40 years ago, we had no good data sets describing the global variations of, say, sea soil temperature for a sufficiently long time. Also, the global climate model was still in a rudimentary state. The situation changed in the late 1980s. Several factors became more favorable, among them that a global warming became sustainable. Climate models had significantly matured, now with a dynamic ocean and sea ice components. Examples of possible greenhouse gas scenarios which were analyzed in the framework with a new, newly established IPCC process became available. Much improved data sets of surface temperature extending to the late 19th century had been constructed. Thus, we could construct powerful fingerprints, in particular in terms of temperature, as suggested by the models and the associated theory of the effect of the disturbed atmospheric related planets due to elevated atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. I had also invested time in updating the original publication from 1979 and was happy that my co worker's assessment that it was a clearer description of the concept. All this ended in success, namely that my co workers, Garby Hegel and Hans von Stuch, together with myself, could reject the null hypothesis, according to which the observed warming could be explained by internal noise variations. Instead, we concluded that we had detected a signal emerging from the sea of noise. This is illustrated by a diagram from the 1990s, which shows that in the, in the artificial world of a scenario simulation, the signal emerged from the noise in the observer data at the very end of the record in the 1990s, growing still more strongly in the simulation over a longer time. Furthermore, we demonstrated that most of the signal could be attributed to a combination of elevated greenhouse gas concentrations and of aerosols in the atmosphere. The diagram shows ellipses within which a 50-year trend would be consistent with different drivers. This was a significant result. In plain words, it was a proof that human activities are changing the climate and that ongoing emissions will continue to change the climate until global emissions are massively reduced. We know now that ceasing global warming can be achieved only if emissions become zero or negative in the near future. This assertion becomes a cornerstone in the assessment of the IPCC and international agreements on how to respond to this perspective. On that occasion, the public and media interest in climate change increased. But I went on to other things. I returned to the issue, however, when global air temperatures rose to less than predicted for several years in the 2000s. This was a little startling, and I asked a co-worker to examine if this new observation evidence would contradict our claim of detection. They found that such a slow hiatus warming was quite rare but possible in global warming scenarios, and that we would have to reconsider our analysis of global warming if it continued. Fortunately, it did not, and our statistical proof of the reality of the human signal weathered this falsification attempt. As usual, failed attempts of falsification strengthened the original claim. After that episode, which was after my retirement, my interests wandered to different topics. One of them was the continuation of my efforts in the spirit of the economist Bill Nuthaus to add a social economic dimension to simplified climate models. The other was my attempt to unify particle theory with the concept of metrons. But so far, my wife and I have not received a breakthrough in the physics community. But let us come back to the issue that is the focal point here. The concept of a stochastic climate system and the detection and attribution of climate change. While my two key papers dealt with specific issues, they were related to a more general concept, which I published in 1998 under the name of Principal Interaction Patterns, or PIPs. In hindsight, these topics are connected, with PIPs being a general concept. For any analysis and prediction of variability, it is then mandatory to reduce the number of degrees of freedom massively. This can be achieved only using series of patterns or modes to expand the field of physical variables such as temperature or velocity. Thus it makes sense to ask for patterns which are best suited for both analysis and for prediction. In the PIP concept, a small subspace is determined within which the dynamics of interest takes place. This is the signal space, spanned by vectors named PIPs. Using the PIPs, ideally, predictions are possible. The remaining infinite-dimensional space is ruled by a stochastic process, 
which are conditioned by the state of the signal space. The effect of these numerous stochastic processes on the signal space is summarized and described by parameterizations. To do so, one determines from observational evidence or detailed numerical simulations which effect is observed to a variety of states in the signal space. The distribution, or often the expected value of this distribution, is then considered the expected effect of the resolved components. In this way, a lower dimensional stochastically closed dynamics is determined, which is hoped will allow the analysis and prediction of the phenomena of interest. In its full generality and beauty, the PIP concept is still waiting for efficient implementation. So far, only a rather simple linear ansatz has been established successfully, namely the principal oscillation patterns, or POPs, which identifies real and complex eigenvectors represented of the dynamics with potential for prediction. The tropical, Madden and Julian oscillation is a case where the POPs have demonstrated their potential. The detection and attribution part may be understood in terms of the POP concept, while the PIPs are the fingerprints of the expected trauma responses, which are embedded in a sea of internal variability. And we find the concept even the design of climate models where a smaller part of the dynamics is resolved by the usual equations, while the signal space is limited to, for example, spherical harmonics of sufficiently large scale. The parallelizations describe the expected effects of the unresolved and thus unknown state of the smaller scales or variables not explicitly considered. Thus, in a sense, climate modeling makes sense only if such a separation in the signal and noise is possible, even if the signal may represent very different animals. Let me say, in addition, something about climate computer models. Realizing that we needed extended computer facilities to develop climate models, I decided to set up a large computing center, the Deutsches Klimarechtsinstitut, or DKI set, which was to be led by Wolfgang Zell. This move made it possible to carry out very large simulations with our new climate model. The computer system was updated regularly. The system continues to run smoothly in 2021. A further important task was to communicate the results of our research to the public. This really became a problem. I was not good in communicating with the public, and I thought it would be actually rather use my time and talent concentrating on research. Two of my colleagues, Mojib Latif and Mohan Munkasan, took over this task most effectively. They became well known as a popular link between climate research and the press and the public, while at the same time contributing essentially to research. The public found the information interesting, but there was no adequate political reaction. People are not used to thinking in longer term times. When former farmers passed on the farm to their sons, they took care of it in a different way than nowadays, where the current profit and the so-called high standard of living is considered more important. To inform and help the politicians, I developed coupled climate and economic models with my wife and later Dmitry Kowalewski. I had always been interested in economics. Important aspects of the models, in my view, were the dynamical and multi-timescale nature of the system both the natural sciences and the human parts. My view was that the inherent uncertainty of all model components calls for the development of models as statistical optimization models. Model results were important to guide climate related policy making despite the inherent uncertainties of the models. It has now been 50 years since the Club of Rome published its first warnings about environmental changes by mankind. And we climate researchers have been warning for the last 40 years, proving scientifically that climate change is real. The IPCC combined all climate research results already in the support of 1990 and received the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize in 2007. However, not enough has happened to stop global warming. The next two graphs demonstrate how climate warming has been increasing. The black curve shows the variations of CO2 during hundreds of thousands of years. The blue lines show the differences, difference in temperatures. And in detailed global distribution, you see the associated mean temperature rise between 1970 and 2020. First, the 50 year ensemble means, and then the 50 year ensemble standard deviation, and the 10 year ensemble mean, and the 10 year ensemble standard deviation. These scientific results should have spurred society and politicians to action long ago. A young girl of 15 had to place herself in front of the Swedish parliament on the 20th of August in 2018 with a sign saying, Skolstrike for Klimatet, 
in order to found a worldwide movement, Fridays for Future. Another way to stir up the public and voters more than we scientists have been able to. Thank you, Greta. I'm thankful to my family who had to leave with a husband, father, and grandfather whose mind was often far away in clouds, composed of noise, signals, waves, and spectra. And I'm thankful to the Max Planck Society, which made this possible, and in particular, I'm least. Lastly, I'm thankful to all my PhD students, postdocs, co workers, colleagues, without whom it would have not been possible to explore the application of my ideas. I ask for your understanding if I do not name all of these important people. I'm sure to have forgotten some. To solve the problem of global warming, it is now imperative to listen to scientists and engineers in order to understand the massive changes that are necessary to keep out the alive and to address the climate, the collapse of the variety of species, the accumulation of trash, social differences, mass migration, starvation, population growth, etc., 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 are urgent advice of politicians. The longer we wait, the more expensive the necessary transformation will be. In addition, the cost of damage caused by extreme weather conditions, pandemic diseases, and global mass migration will only grow with time. We cannot wait. Thank you. The second part of the prize is given to Professor Giorgio Parisi of the University of Rome, the Sapienza, and the Academy's citations read, for the discovery of the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical systems from atomic to planetary scales. Professor Parisi was born in 1948 and received his education at the University of Rome. Later, he was a researcher at the Laboratori Nazionali di Frescati and held visiting positions at renowned universities in the United States and France before returning as a full professor to the University of Rome, where he is active today. Although Professor Parisi's work spans a vast range of subjects, from the physics of elementary particles to the amazing patterns in flocks of birds. The Nobel Committee has singled out his work on glassy materials, where his papers on replica symmetry breaking and his introduction of the Parisi order parameter have been instrumental to the further development of the theory of complex systems. And with this, I invite you to listen to Professor Parisi's Nobel lecture. In this lecture, I am going to speak about multiple equilibria. Now, there are many other things I could speak about. Stochastic resonance, intermittency and turbulence in multifractal, KPZ equation, granular matter, large-scale simulation of spin glasses. However, I will try to concentrate myself on this particular point, multiple equilibria. The idea on multiple equilibria was something that was floating around in many sciences at the beginning of the 70s. For example, in 72, Eldridge and Gould proposed the theory of punctuated equilibria, and in this theory there was a long period of stasis that were punctuated by very fast change in the morphology of the, of the animal. And therefore, there was equilibrium, stasis, and the change, and again, stasis again. In the modern theory of memory that was done by Herb, Little, Offil, Amit, the part of the brain that is responsible for the memory stays in a similar number of equilibrium states. Each state corresponds to a, a memory that at that moment had been recalled. The extraordinary large number of items that we can memorize depends on the extraordinary large number of possible equilibrium states. Also, complex systems have many long periods of equilibrium separated to fast transition to equilibrium point. This may happen for ecosystem, in climate glaciation, in geological era, in animal behavior. Also, in the theory of glasses, there was an argument by Goldstein in 1968, where the, his idea is that a low enough temperature, a super, super cool liquid, explores the phase space 
to activate a jump between different minima. And also the where the multiple equilibrium is well known concept to economists, for example, the Nobel laureate Gerard Debreu wrote a power paper economic to refine a set of equilibrium. There is uh, also the floating around the idea of a corrugated landscape or rugged land space, um, and that the functions on which the system uh, depends on was to add a lot of minima, a lot of maximum, a lot of set point, and the minimum uh, uh, were so exponentially large, and the type of behavior was controlled by possible movement between different minima. This may be in different contexts, uh, fitness for evolution, energy for other things, uh, cost for optimization problem, and so on. So this idea of corrugated landscape was uh, ubiquitous in many science, however it was not easy to put all things together and to produce a, a theory for this all kind of phenomena. With the standard way that we do with ph in physics, write a question, solve the question, look to what the question means, and so on and so on. The situation changed but in a completely unexpected uh, way, by a nice experiment that was done by Candela, Maidos, Budnik in 1971, where they were seen a transition in metallic spin glasses. Metallic spin glass are an alloy of iron and uh, gold, and they were seen a sharp transition in this, uh, in this system at a lower temperature and at a low uh, concentration of iron. And just because it was a low concentration of iron, it was not a ferromagnetic transition. Of course, if you look to the experimental data, there is nothing that resembles you all the problems that I said on multiple equilibrium and so on. And, however, we'll see later on the relation with that. Now, the theory started to, to work on this uh, kind of phenomena, and the most um, um, important paper uh, was done by Edward Anderson in '75. They wrote the species form of the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian was, was essentially the simplest one that one could write for a three dimensional system nearest neighbor interaction with a random coupling. The fact is that the random the coupling between the pins were random, no ferromagnetic, no antiferromagnetic, was the novelty of this model. Of course, once that you write a model, you have to study it, you cannot solve it uh, exactly. And uh, Edward Anderson introduced a very important concept. Uh, the idea is uh, what people call the Edward or Anderson or the parameter. The, the idea is very simple, that in each sample the, the, the spins at low temperature develop a spontaneous magnetization. However, this spontaneous magnetization change in, in a random way from a site to site because also the coupling constant are random. And the great idea of Edward Anderson was to introduce as all the parameter the square, the average of the square of the local magnetization. Peak of something, measure discussing when the system was in a temperature or the system in low temperature. They also introduced some kind of mean field approximation where they use the so called replica method. Now, the problem is that, technically speaking, we want to do the average, not of the partition function, but we want to do the average of the free energy. Therefore, what we have to do, essentially, first to compute the log of the partition function after doing the average. This is rather a complex procedure, and what they say is that this procedure may be simplified by what was called the replica trick, or the replica method, and the idea was to write z to the power n as a product of n factor zj. And now one can do the average of j and one can involve a formula that involves uh, the integral of uh, n, n, n minus 1 divided 2 variable, I mean, in standard integral. And now the second part was, was quite strange and was taken now n is no more an integer, and we use a formula that, uh, that 
that connects the log to the uh, value uh, of z to a power n in the limit n go to zero. It's clearly that at this stage, question, hoping that the result may be correct in the end. And that was what people were doing. Now, Sherrington Kirkpatrick made a thread of progress by simplifying uh, the model of uh, or Edward Anderson considered an infinite range model where all spins are connected to other spins with a coupling that was small, and the idea is, is that for this model you should, uh, you should have mean field theory. Indeed, the mean field theory is usually defined in modern language by the solution of a model where the interactions are infinite range, all spin interact with, with the other one in such a way that we can use uh, mean field, uh, uh, mean field theory in the sense that the average of a different object may be substituted by the mean. Now, the, for the SK gave a very nice formulation, and it was an exact formulation that z to the n could be written as an integral of a, a certain number of n by n matrices, and, uh, and when the number of spin were going to infinity, it was uh, one had to consider uh, approximate these things by certain function f computed at the minimum, this minimum value. And, uh, and of course they have to do these things in the limit n go to zero, which is also the problem of replica trick deriving something from integer n and after allowing you to go into n equal to zero. Now, the paper of uh, Shevington and Kirkpatrick made an extra innocent looking assumption that the minimum was at the point where the matrix have all equal elements. However, the result was uh, not consistent of the paper. It was clear to the author that the results were wrong uh, because also the entropy was negative at low temperature and we know the entropy in this model cannot be negative. There was a lot of, of uh, doubts to, to tentative to understand why it was wrong. Finally, their Taules proved that the point where they looked, so was supposed to the putative minimum was not the minimum where is the value or which is the value of the minimum of this function f of q. Now, <coughs> There have been attempts to use in this, uh, as, uh, to look for the minimum a matrix whose elements are not all equal to Q. It was considered where the n replicas may be divided into a group of uh, m replicas with m integer, and the value of the matrix element depends in which group the indexes belong to. However, these, these uh, t tentatives were not successful in the sense that one was not solving the problem of having a negative entropy and also a right value of the internal energy. Now, in 1979, I had the intu intuition to take also m non-integer. It's clear that these procedures do not make sense. You cannot uh, take groups composed by a number of objects with not integer. It does not make sense in the same way that it does not make sense to think of a regular polygon with 3.5 side uh, or 3.5 angle. However, uh, it was clear that uh, however, this nonsensical procedure can be put in the, into the formula and it was going in the right direction there is, and the entropy was negative only for a much smaller temporal interval. And what was quite surprising, that after a repeated infinite times this procedure, the, uh, the final formula were fully consistent and the entropy were not negative. So, the, uh, so finally we get something that may, could make sense doing this procedure that's clearly beyond any type of uh, conventional mathematics. Now, what is quite interesting is that the final formula for the free energy were not crazy. There is some explicit formula that is not worthwhile to describe in, in words, but there is some kind of function f of q or x 
that is uh, depends on function q of x and this function q of x plays uh, all the parameters the function is rather complex and uh, the free energy was uh, obtained as a maximization of this uh, free energy function. Now, it's clear now we come back to respect, uh, respectable mathematics. Everything here makes sense. One has completely forgotten the fact that this formula is obtained by crazy method and the other parameter now is a function. However, this uh, approach gave both correctly the value of the entropy never negative and also the value of the internal energy that was obtained by simulation. Now, it was not clear which was the meaning of this function that was introducing, which was the value of q of x and more which was the value of this variable x that was between 0 and 1. There were some hints on the possibility because on the meaning, but because some relations that one was people were proved to be true were not anymore true, especially for the susceptibility. And I have, I have no idea of the meaning of QX. I mean, I derived the formula, but after I derived the formula, I looked to the formula, but I was not able to make a, a further advances to do any interpretation of the formula. So at the end of 79, I, start, I started to study other problems, waiting for some inspiration to do in further progresses. In the fall of 72, I start to work again on the problem, and I found that the formula that I wrote three years before implied that the spin glass system has many equilibrium states, and they are loved by alpha, and each of these states appear equilibrium with set a probability W alpha. So what came out in a completely, at, at least for me, unexpected way, that this uh, spin glass contained in multiple equilibria, that was the thing that I was introduced at the beginning of the lecture, it contains a multiple equilibria, not, uh, not from, because you can, could see that uh, numerical or experimental that there was multiple equilibria, because the mathematical formalism, the crazy mathematical formalism that was developed, was a correct one to describe systems that have multiple equilibrium. Now, the thing that was interesting, that each of these states is characterized by its own magnetization, therefore the magnetization are different, and therefore, well, instead of having one overlap, defined as before, we could have overlap uh, Q or Edward Anderson parameter depending if you, the magnetization that you take. If magnetization or look to the pro scalar product or magnetization state alpha with set gamma. And therefore, at the end of the game, each sample of the system has its own matrix Q and all its own weight W. Now, the fact that now the other parameter is a random quantity, and uh, because the Q is a random, uh, random in now, and the weight are also random, explain why one had to introduce a function Q of X. And uh, if, if one looks to the tails, X at the end, at the mean, in some way, meaning that is connected to the probability. Now, let's come back to the problem of susceptibility. I, Mentioned before that this relation k equal to beta 1 minus q either Anderson is no more satisfied. But why? Now, there's, uh, we should look back to something fundamental. What the magnetic susceptibility measures is how the magnetization change adding a magnetic field. If we add the magnetic field at lower temperature, we measure the linear response susceptibility. However, this, uh, uh, this linear response susceptibility is such that the system does not have the time uh, possibility to go to another, uh, another equilibrium. Therefore, the linear response susceptibility that you measure adding a magnetic field lower temperature is the magnetic susceptibility of the system inside a given equilibrium state. Now, if we add the field at higher temperature and we cool the system, therefore a different procedure, because in the previous procedure we cool the system we add the field. The second procedure, we, we add the field and we cool the system, we measure the field cooled susceptibility 
which is a, a good proxy of the thermodynamic susceptibility. Therefore, we have two susceptibility. Thermodynamic susceptibility that may be approximated by the field cooled susceptibility and the linear response susceptibility. The formula are different. In the theory, one find out that the formula are different. The linear response susceptibility is given by the old formula which involves a Edward Anderson parameter, and the field cool susceptibility is given by a new formula that involves the, um, the old function Q of X. Now, it was clear uh, already at that time that uh, the linear response susceptibility and the field cool susceptibility were different in experiment. Now you can so you can see in, on the right uh, side uh, panel the theoretical prediction for the field cool susceptibility in red, the uh, in blue the prediction for the uh, linear response susceptibility. In the high temperature region beyond the, uh, they are equal, and only when there is uh, the region at low temperature where the, there is a spin glass phase transition, the two are different. If you look to the, on the right panel, you see the same, the same result from experiments, and you see that they, they look very similar. The one that I put in here are the result on, on uh, 98, but there was a previous result not as precise as this one. We showed this type of behavior. So you can see already from that, that this, this basic experiment on how susceptibility do behave in real three-dimensional cases is very good in agreement, apart from minor delta H near the transition, but this is always true with the prediction on mean field theory. Now, what uh, this we are doing, because you see there was a matrix U, a matrix U a, all, all, of the or the overlap between different states, the, the Ws and the, the weight, and the, well, the problem of understanding the statistical property of Z. And in 1983, I started to work with Mezar, Sulas, Toulouse, and Vivasoro. We found that the state satisfies what was called an ultrametricity property. Ultrametricity implies that the states stays on the leaves on the tree, and the distance between states is proportional to the distance that you have to go on the tree. Now, this, this tree is an extremely complex object because it has states that are branching at any level and has an infinite number of branches, and it appears in a completely unexpected way. And however, tree is very interesting because for many reasons, when we do a standard taxonomy, taxonomy is essentially a hierarchical classification, like the one that is done for living beings. You have this taxonomy is possible only if you if the if the object can be classified in a hierarchical way, and if you can classify something in a hierarchical way, think of animal. Animal may be cordata, cordata may be mammals, mammals may be primata, primata may be apes or other monkey, and so on. This this means that you have this post hierarchical classification means that you can put a sense in the tree. What well, I think that everybody of you has seen the tree of evolution. And the tree of evolution is something that arises also for historical reasons because living object has evolved in this way. Now, what is quite impressive is that uh, in the case of spring glasses, we have uh, such a structure which has the same complexity as the tree of evolution, with, in principle, infinitely many states in the infinite volume limit. And, it's, it's, and uh, that was uh, something that was completely unexpected. And also this came out essentially from, from, the, from, uh, from the theory. Now, the credit form at the end, the credit form of the Q matrix is equivalent to this extremely complex probability distribution. 
I was extremely skeptical about the possibility of finding the proof because uh, why this probability distribution should be this one and how could you prove that everything was correct? Fortunately, mathematicians entered in the game and the situation changed rapidly. At the end of the 90s, Francesco Guerra introduced new ideas in the field. The correctness of the previous formula was proved by Talegrand in, 20, in 2001. In 2013, Panchenko proved the correctness of the automatic distribution. This work of the mathematician has been fundamental to bypass, uh, to, to get, uh, bypass the strange mathematics or the hypotheses that were not clear where coming from, and proving that uh, everything that was done was at the end had a rigorous uh, proof that uh, eliminate any possible doubts on the correctness of the result. Now, the original uh, proof is uh, have been completely forgotten, and I would like uh, it would be very interesting if one could prove something mathematical in the, using formula that are similar to the original proof. Of course, speaking, a non-integer number object is not easy from the mathematical point of view. In certain contexts can be done, in other contexts not, but one has to do some good work to understand. Now, one, uh, one point that I would like to discuss is the idea that was put forward by Anderson of a spin glass as a, a cornucopia. And the idea is essentially that uh, things that uh, uh, was important for Anderson is that uh, spin glasses were an example of the rugged or uh, uh, corrugated landscape that, as Anderson, underlies many complex simulation problems. And the physical spin glasses and SK model are not only are only a jumping point for an amazing cornucopia of wide ranging application on the same line of thinking. Now, Anderson was completely right. There have been many develop, um, developments in physics that I will not go into discuss here, that uh, are outside the spin glasses, that is the dynamics of the glass system, aging, modified fluctuation dissipation on a long term scale. The, all the work that have been done in the structural glasses, the relevance of replica symmetry breaking for the glass transition, jamming for the R sphere, the exponent of the, uh, for the jamming transition, interface a polymer random media, pinning, heteropolymer, the folding of, uh, of biopolymer, RNA, polymer, protein, and so on. There were a lot of uh, de developments outside physics, artificial neural network, computation of the capacity of associative memory, learning, generalization, neurobiology, optimization of computer science and simulating and healing, random travel statement, constraint satisfaction problem, error correcting code, compressed sensing. There's a huge amount of applications that is spanning toward many regions of physics. So I think that the idea of Anderson that spin glasses is a cornucopia for doing many, many other systems uh, system is uh, something that's certain correct. And also you have seen how this concept of multiple equilibrium finds a natural formulation, the natural mathematics to deal with, the natural probability tools that have been developed by mathematicians in order to get the, the final result, the co a correct result. And now the only, the last thing that I would like to do is a big thank to all the people that I was lucky to work with. The, you have uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this picture contains a list of 317 scientists I was uh, worked. The list is updated to three years ago, to 2018. And the size of the name is proportional to the number of pa uh, papers that we wrote together, roughly speaking. So I would like to thank all these people that uh, helped me a lot. Thank you.